a lightning session, and there's no point in me rabbiting on. So, first off is Carmi Mias, who will talk about own your own journey in a tech skill roller coaster. Big round of applause. Hello, everyone. Um, so, uh, my name is Karma Mias. I'm a freelance web developer. And today I want to talk about uh, how I learned to embrace change and how I keep up or try to keep up with technology. We all know that technology does not stand still. There's always changes in software, hardware, there's different ways of doing things. Change is part of technology's DNA. But change can also be scary. Um, the pressure to keep up and uh, stay relevant can make us feel unsafe and stressed. At the same time, change can also be an opportunity for improvement. Uh, it could be exciting and thrilling. It can make us um, our work better and our life easier. So there's different ways of looking at the same thing. And this change of perspective is something we can learn. Um, in my case, I like to think of a career in tech as a um, long distance track. First, um, you love computers and technology and you decide to work in IT. Then um, you decide uh, you re do your research, you plan your route, you decide you w what you need to learn, and you do some research on courses, and perhaps you want to do a boot, a boot camp or do a degree. Then you actually do your training, and you get your first job in IT or your first project with the thing that you just learned. That is just the beginning of your journey. Now, when you've got your basic training, then all you need to do is keep up and keep pace. Um, before I continue, I would like to tell you a little bit about my own journey. When I started, I said I'm a web developer, but I haven't always been one. My first job in IT was as a PC maintenance teacher. Then I worked as a desktop support and then I moved on to network support. Then a lot of the things um, I learned then are not relevant for what I do now, but the logical thinking and the troubleshooting, the concepts and skills I learned then helped me learn the things I need for my current job. And these are some of the things I've learned in the past three years as a web developer. So. Quite a lot. Some of it I only needed for a particular project, or the things I use all the time or very often. Some of them I only just now getting into. So, how is it done? First thing to do is decide where you want to go and do some research about how to get there. Uh, to, for that, you can use Google, you can compare courses, you can compare, find colleges, you can check syllabuses and prices. But one thing that I've also found very useful is to talk to people. There'll be people, if you go to meetups and conferences, there'll be people there who are already doing what you would like to do. So talk to them, ask them how they got started, uh, what resources work for them. And then you can use social media to stay up to date with developments and also to thank those people, people who gave you their time. After you've got the information, you can start your training. So you join the course or you join a degree, you, um, you're ready for, for studying. But it's quite intense, especially if you are working at the same time. So you need to make learning part of your routine. Um, 
first of all, it's quite a good to set a time, perhaps every day or every week before going to work or in the evening when the children have gone to bed. It's uh, quite important, I think, to involve the people you live with because any changes in your routine will affect their routine. And so... Um, <coughs> They, they, they need to be involved with what you're doing. Also, um, it is important, I think, to keep a balance between theory and uh, practice. You may be doing a structured course and there's already a list of things that they're covering, but um, if, and if you don't practice what the theory, then it's a lot harder to retain the, the knowledge, the new concepts. And also I found it's quite important, for, at least for me, to mix the media. So if I'm doing a, an online course, I'm also perhaps reinforcing a concept I didn't understand with books, or I go to a talk on the thing and perhaps talk, uh, ask questions to the speaker. And also it's important to persist, not to, um, not to lose... Um, track of what you're wanting to achieve. In my case, it helps me, I'm, I'm quite square, so it helps me set clear deadlines for, for every week, what I want to learn and how, which exact concepts or if, which things I'm going to be covering every week or every month. Uh, at the same time, um, my own deadlines are flexible. So before I've learned something, I don't know how long it's going to take me to understand it. So it's all uh, 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 an iterative process and a refining process. Um, and as I said before, it helps me understand something better if I also uh, apply it straight away. For example, I, if I've learned something new, I then try to implement it in an ongoing customer project. And if that's not possible, then I come up with some exercise or side project. Um, um, because it just helps me understand things better. It's not always going to be straightforward. There's going to be moments where you think I'm really struggling with this. I can't take, I'm just never going to get it. It's all, it's all normal because there's all going to be also other moments when you really get it and then it's just going to be a boost for your confidence. So this, all these ups and downs are always normal. Just make room for them. Try to stay positive and keep the vision. Why are you doing this? Why are you learning this thing? Is perhaps because you want to be better at your job or perhaps because you want to get into this other field. Um, be kind to yourself. Remember that is is normal to not always get everything straight away. Perhaps um, some concepts will take you longer than others. That's all normal. And remember to also enjoy what you're doing. Don't, don't, don't think of it just as a struggle. And also remember to keep time, allow time to switch off um, and rest. In the end, you will fi uh, finish your course, you will get your first job in IT or your first project in where you can apply the new thing you've learned. But learning does not stop here. This is... Um, the technology will continue changing, the software will continue evolving. The, everything is just a process, it's not an, uh, an, at the end, it's just the start. And remember that nothing we do is in isolation. So don't stop going to the meetups and conferences or participating in forums after you've learned what you needed to know. Um, there'll be other people who will be just starting and what you've been through will help them in their way. So, yeah, that's it. I just wanted to say, um, and remember to love what you're doing as well. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Carmi. Uh, next up is, sorry, I'm in the way, <laughs> uh, Francesco uh, 
uh, Kenovi uh, speaking about managing remote small teams without going crazy. Thank you. There you go. Okay, hi everybody, welcome uh, to my lightning talk. Um, today I'm going to talk uh, to you about my project management, management framework that allows me to manage m multiple projects at the, at the same time with my, with my remote team while trying to maintain a, a reasonable mental health. Is there here someone that is starting uh, um, a team as a project manager or already works in a team? Okay, so, okay. Uh, I want to tell you that I, I am not here to teach you something. I am, I'm, I'm here to only to share my experience to you because uh, uh, there are miracle receipts uh, and I don't expect that my method will work for everyone, but I hope to share something that will inspire you and hopefully help you improve your very, very own method. Okay, my name is Francesco. Uh, I am a little bit, good, a, a little bit of background. Uh, I am the founder of a, of a web agency um, it's called Black Studio, and I set up it in, in 2002. Uh, I am from Italy, and I live and I work in a very small, a small town in the north part of Italy. It's called Carpinetti. It's near Reggio Emilia, the home of Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese. I don't know if someone likes it. Um, Carpinetti is not really famous for, for technology. Uh, it's a nice place if you like mountains or grain fields or medieval castles, Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese, as I told you before, and kettles. Yeah. But as you might imagine, this is not an ideal place to, to set up a web agency. Um, there aren't many engineers around and designers as well. And cows are not good, so good at coding. So uh, remote collaborations what, were not an option for me. Uh, was a really a core necessity, uh, especially in 2002 when remote teams were much less common than, than in these days. And it, it was also for me, it was a, a choice, a lifestyle. So it's because I didn't want to move to a bigger city to, to make my job. So let's go straight to the point. What do I mean for a small team? Uh, according, uh, accordingly to Jeff Sutherland, the inventor of the Scrum system, uh, seven people plus or minus three uh, is the ideal size to maximize the effectiveness of, uh, of a team. Uh, currently at Blick Studio, we are, we are eight people. Uh, how many projects can such a team manage at the same time? Well, in an ideal world, uh, I would recommend not to manage multiple projects at the same time. At Black Studio, at this very moment, uh, we, we have more than 20, 20 active projects. They are not all working at the same pace, and they cover a huge uh, span of sizes, but yes, this is a, a pretty big number. Uh, though having so many open projects might seem like a project management failure, in the real world, this is very common. Uh, in fact, it's not, it's not always possible to close a project before starting on another uh, because clients could be unresponsive and the scope of the project could change during the develop development phase and, and dilate time. So I decided that instead of trying to force a project to its end before uh, starting on another, uh, it might be better to follow the flow okay, and learn to manage multiple projects at the same time. Of course, this needs a lot of discipline. And so how I do that. Um, I basically uh, use a 10 points framework. Uh, the first, it seems obvious, but it's not. Carefully select your team members because remote work, working is not for everyone. Uh, the most important skill for everyone in your team is communication. Uh, make sure to test your candidates, not, not only because they are great engineers or great designer, but because they are great at communicate with you. Uh, a great engineer or designer that cannot communicate with you efficiently uh, might not be a great asset for your company. Uh, then I set up a central point for tasks in, in information distribution because, because they don't want that people uh, is craving for information. They have to know where the information are. So, uh, and make this central point accessible to all team members. We do this for every project and every team member can see tasks assigned to other team members. At Black Studio, we use Asana, which is a pretty popular project management software, but you can use Trello, Basecamp, or whichever software you are comfortable with. Uh, in Asana, we plan, list, and assign tasks to all the team members, but we also link the external documents that make up the core of the project. As you can see, those are some links of our documents. Uh, for example, the contract, uh, a reference document. It's a com uh, document uh, made in Google Docs uh, um, with all the details of the project, and then also client reference, which is a Google Docs document shared with the client in case we, we need it. 
to share information with the clients. So, uh, and then I set up a sh uh, shared Google Drive folder. Uh, you can also use OneDrive or Dropbox, and uh, we put every needed opportune file in, in there. Uh, we named the folder with the name of the project, so anyone can implicitly know where to find it. Uh, it seems obvious, but if the project implies code development, uh, set up a code collaboration environment like Git, we use GitLab, but you can use GitHub and so forth. Okay, now a central part. It's time to start listing tasks and assigning them to all the team. Uh, this is a very important part of the project management because the problem I've seen over and over again is that project managers have difficulty managing the workload of every single member. So we don't work, but, uh, we don't work by the hour for clients. Uh, we usually work by the project. Uh, so every project needs to be estimated in advance. Uh, my method is very simple. I set a time estimate for every task in the project backlog. I split tasks that need more than four hours in multiple parts to avoid some mistakes in, in estimate. Um, we tried in the past to track tasks with time tracking tools like, for example, Harvest or Toggle, but I soon discovered that it was too demanding for the team members to manage this approach. Um, um, tracking error w w were too, too much frequent. Uh, plus, clients want to determine the needed budget in advance, uh, and they are not likely to pay ex post. So we prefer now to estimate in advance, and team members can give me a feedback if I made some relevant estimate mistakes, so I can take it into account for future estimations. Uh, we work in weekly slots, so every full-time uh, team member, independently of the single project, uh, is assigned a maximum of 30 hours of tasks every week. Uh, all assigned tasks have to be completed by the following Friday, so it's a, because we call it a weekly slot. All team members usually work on multiple projects at the same time, but I always respect the 30 hour uh, per week workload limit. Um, as full-time member works 40 hours a week, it, it means that the remaining 10 hours are left as a buffer uh, to absorb time estimate error or unexpected issues. Uh, we use the project chat room because asynchronous communication between the team members is maintained in Dasana, but for, but for synchronous communication, we create a project chat room in Skype. Uh, you, can use, you can use Slack if you prefer, but we prefer Skype because we already use it for clients, uh, and it, since it, it is more widely adopted, and we want to use at least amount of tools as possible. Don't impose your methodology to clients. Communicate with the clients in a way that they are comfortable with. Don't, don't try to embark them using Asana like, like, like you do. Clients don't want to adapt to you. So it's up to the project manager to track every request from the clients in Asana. Communicate with email, with the phone, whatever you want, and whatever the, the client is comfortable with. Uh, Meetings are planned in a calendar because uh, in, since in Asana we work on a weekly slot, every task is due for the next uh, um, Friday. So, but meets needs to, meets, meetings needs to be done at a, on a certain day and on a certain time. So I put them in a shared Google calendar and every, every team member so can have a clear idea of the meeting plan for the week. Build a knowledge base. Um, a knowledge base is a place where a team can find piece of, pieces of information about frequently needed topics. So this is a really useful because once maintained, the team members can self-serve and prevent a lot of time losses due to asking and answering all the, the same questions at the time. And lastly, create procedures for repetitive tasks. We have a procedure for a website kickoff, checklist for a website publication, a CIO audit procedure, and so forth. Don't reinvent the wheel every time. Oh, this is a scheme uh, where you can visualize the central role of the task manager and all the documents and hard assets. As you can see, we don't use many tools, but it's enough for us. So this is a 10-point summary of what I told you. Can, you. If you are interested, you can find it on my website, uh, as well as the slides. I am also available for discussion. There are my contacts. And if you are interested, we are also hiring. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Francesco. Uh, right, last talk is Steve Folland, whose talk is freelancers don't freak out. So, last for last time today, big round of applause. <laughs> don't freak out, don't freak out, don't freak out. <laughs> um, 
cool. Thanks very much. So, yes, my name's Steve Holland, and I'm, well, I'm a freelance video and audio person, but I also uh, run a website, beingfreelance.com. Thank you. Uh, which, uh, the main thing to that is the podcast. So every week, I chat to a different freelancer about their story, about their experience, and they share their insights. So we've spoken to over 100 people now, 124th episode went out today, I think it was. So I thought what I'd do is share some of their tips, not really mine, uh, in that it might help you on your freelance uh, journey or if you end up being freelance as well. And the first one is... Well, it could almost be like a mantra. It's kind of like poetic in its brevity. The first one is, don't freak out. Because there are loads of times when you might freak out when you're a freelancer, like when you don't have any work, when you have too much work, when your invoices haven't been paid, when it's your tax return, the first ever time you've done a self-assessment, uh, the second time you do a self-assessment, the third time. <laughs> don't freak out. Trust yourself that it will be okay. By the way, I should say, for the benefit of the people who gave these quotes, that the images used in this presentation are not them, especially for Louisa's benefit, uh, if she ever sees this. My second favourite quote, possibly, was this one. Now, Fraser wasn't saying that you have to be unpleasant. Uh, he's a thoroughly nice chap. But this is more about the... Uh, potential for people to take advantage of you. When some clients who aren't quite as nice as you are don't pay you, it can be easy just to phone them up and they say, oh, do you know what, we'll pay you, sorry, the print, uh, what is it, invoice run has just gone, we'll pay you, whatever that is, we'll, um, we'll pay you next week, I promise, it'll be done. At that point, don't be nice about it, be persistent about it, you've done the work, so make sure that you get paid for it. So yeah, just be persistent. Um, because nice guys get paid last. Because ultimately, you're running a business when you're a freelancer. You might get into it because you're a passionate developer or de designer, illustrator. I've spoken to lots of different type of freelancer. But you have to take it seriously uh, in order to survive. Know your finances and understand them. Even if you get a bookkeeper or an accountant, and you, I really should have done that before I did, um, even if you do that, you should still try and understand where the money's going, um, what subscriptions you've got, uh, where your profit margins are, where, where the most profitable things that you do are. And time track, always, this was Timmy's advice. Uh, this was less about um, like quote, you know, like charging people per hour. It was more about the fact that actually, on the next project, you can look back at all of that time that you've decided to track and therefore better gauge what the next project is going to be, just like Francesco was just talking about. Sarah said you have to value yourself. Sometimes you can really start to doubt yourself, especially when you're working by yourself and you're the only person. So value yourself. In fact, I... Um, I often ask, well, in fact, I always ask every guest on the podcast, if you could tell your younger self one thing about being freelance, what would that be? And Stephanie said, I'd tell my younger self I'm worth double. Somebody said that in this room earlier on as well, about doubling what you're charging. So it's worth thinking about. This one is more about marketing, though, because that's the other thing. Remember, I said you're a business. As a freelancer, there's no good just being the best at what you do. You have to make sure other people realize you're the best at what you do. So start putting yourself out there in whichever way you're comfortable with, be it videos or blog posts or meeting people. With your portfolio, don't just show work that you've done, show work that you want to do in the future. Because we all take gigs where, you know, it's maybe not the best thing in the world, but we've got bills to pay. This, um, this is what Sarah said, but quite a few people have said this. Maybe, um, maybe they're only putting on their portfolio what they want to do in the future. And that can also mean um, creating side projects or opportunities like for charities, for example, where you create the work that you want to be known for and share it because of that, even if you haven't been paid to do it yet. Ran, who was from Israel, said this. 
I think he liked to eat lunch, Ran. He had a lot of lunches, but he made a lot of friends, and he has a very successful business. This was his way to do marketing. Because ultimately, people remember people. People buy from people. And the more, in fact, I've heard this the last two talks, both said this, all about meeting people. And getting to know those people is also really important. So that you build really important relationships with them. Not just clients either. Um, just to underline this point, there's another one. Just keep meeting people. Um, Matt pointed out that this was a snowball effect as well. So when you start out in your career, maybe you don't know that many people and it can feel really tough. But just keep believing in it. Keep going out there, meeting more people and word will spread about what good stuff you're doing. But it's not just about the work that you do, but also, like in this environment, meeting other people doing similar things to what you're doing. Because other freelancers aren't the enemy. There's enough work to go around, so don't think about other people as competition. I remember going to a networking event once, and the first person I met was also a video freelancer. And I was like, man, like all these people I wanted to work with, and you're here too? Utter nonsense. He and I have become good friends. He's hired me about three times. I've hired him about seven times. There's enough work to go around. Not only that, but when we meet up for a coffee, we can also share the projects that we're going on, the problems that we're going through. So just keep meeting people. And if you don't find a meetup to go to, maybe start one. If you live somewhere where there isn't something happening, same goes for co-working spaces as well. If there isn't a co-working space near you, maybe think about starting one. Big organisations pay a lot of money uh, in order to build their brand, to have an identity, to build their voice. But you have been building your voice since you were a kid. And this was kind of what Paddy was about. As a freelancer, you are your best kind of um, your best marketing really the real you so be yourself and celebrate that when I think of all the people I've spoken to I remember the ones who fly helicopters tell me about their veganism their kids their dogs the fact they play the piano whatever it might be be yourself actually speaking of the person who flies helicopters that was Rachel Ingram um she schedules life first. She, she puts in when she's going to fly her helicopter. She puts in the fact that she volunteers for, um, for guide dogs for the blind on a Friday. Um, kind of jealous of her life in many ways. But for me, that might mean um, putting in when I'm going to meet a friend for lunch or when I'm going to go for a run. Not that I particularly like to, so then I'll also schedule time to go and have some cake. But schedule life first, because otherwise work can fill all of your time, and that's not healthy for anyone. This one is going to be the opening song in Being Freelance and Musical. You can sing that along in your head right now, if you like. I'll save you from it, though. Um, this is really about working smarter, systems, think about your processes, think about the way that you can work best through everything that you do. A um, bit like Francesco was just talking about, so I won't dwell on it too much. Um, Paul Boag, who's a very smart chap, said this to me. This is his way of getting things done. And actually, whilst I do often work at the weekend, I agree with this in that Whenever I set myself constraints, like I know I've got to pick the kids up at 3.30, or I know I'm not going to be working on Sunday because I'm here, I actually end up getting more done because I have less time available. So set yourself constraints. Don't let being freelance fill all of your time. And stop being so available. Don't always answer your phone. Don't always reply to that email. And learn to say no, because not every opportunity is a good opportunity. And when you say yes to everything, it means that you can't take on that next opportunity comes along. Or that next slice of cake with a friend. Or that next helicopter ride on the nice day. And back to Sarah, who again said, what do you have to lose? So... As you walk into that networking event, as you think about that client who asked you to do something that you're not quite comfortable about, when you think about signing up to stand in front of a stage of people at a WordPress event on a Sunday in April, ask yourself, what do you have to lose? And remember, 
the three key words, don't freak out. Um, thank you very much. You can hear lots of quotes at beingfreelance.com and the podcast. Thank you. Sorry, can I uh, ask uh, Francesco and Carme to come back up and Steve to stay up here? Just uh, if anybody's got, we've got, I think we've got a few minutes for questions, I think. Yeah, we've got a few minutes for questions. So uh, if anybody has got any questions to any of the speakers, uh, yes, I'll... I'll uh, yeah, there's a mic coming down, yeah. Hello, um, it's for Francesca. Um, you said when hiring people that are working remotely, yeah. um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, that choose people who are good at communication skills. How do you go about that yourself? Because, you know, not choose communication or technical, and I agree, I agree, but how do you test that before hiring uh, yeah. them? We have uh, an embarking process which, which uh, uh, has a trial pe period. Yeah. Uh, for first, we, we make a train where, where we explain th this kind of method. So we want, this is the first thing that we want that people working with us know. And then we try for one month, usually. Thanks a lot. Sorry, I, I, I keep looking around. Has anybody else got any questions for any of the speakers? There's a question just there. Uh, this one's for Steve. I just wondered if you had any tips for going from full-time into freelance. Um, yeah, well, lots of my guests have done it on the side, so that's that's one key thing. Uh, so maybe they've then built up a bank of uh, money <laughs> to uh, to uh, like a buffer of money. I didn't do that myself, and it was stupid. So if you've got the time available, then uh, do that. Also, by working on the side, like in the evenings, you'll start to build up your portfolio, your confidence, potential clients, and then start to get out and put the word out there on the side. But um, like, if you listen to lots of the guests, I always ask them like how they got started and how they find their first clients. But um, I think if you really want to do it, then eventually you'll feel confident to take the jump. But remember that everybody always thinks that they're not ready. So eventually just do it. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another question there in the middle. Hi, Francesco. Um, you were talking about remote teams and how do you cope with different time zones? Do you, do you have people in different time zones if they're working on projects together and the time zones are vastly different? Do you stipulate that they have to have certain hours together for the project chat in Skype or how do you cope with that, please? Um, we try to communicate as, as much as possible uh, asynchronously, uh, but actually we have... Um, to meet sometimes on Skype, uh, so we, we need to uh, agree for uh, 20 or three minutes uh, a, a week for, uh, for a call together, yes. But actually, we, we, but in fact, uh, uh, currently we, we are all, all in, the, in the same time zone, only, only sometimes when we need to externalize bigger projects, we use people in other time zones, so it, it's not really a, a big problem for us, so that's it. Thank you. Any more questions? There's a question over there. Sorry. Hi. It's a question for Kami. How far ahead do you plan your kind of own self-directed learning program? And um, how do you prioritize? What I say um, at the moment, I'm trying to learn uh, Gutenberg blocks. Um, but so that's the objective, and then what I do is just one week ahead. So this week I'm gonna do this bit, because if I try to think of of it as the bigger objective, sometimes it feels too big and too difficult. So that's why I cut it in in shorter chunks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? I actually can't see. No? I think that's it. Okay, big round of applause for all the speakers. Carmen Mias, Francesco Canovi, and Steve Holland. Thank you very much.